Good morning, Freedom Church. Come on, you're awake. Online campus, Nairobi, so great to be with you. And we are gearing up for some incredibly special Christmas gatherings. We hope you join us this week. It's really going to be awesome. And we're in the third part of our series called All the Fields. We're talking about the Christmas story and just the crazy emotions and the ups and downs that people felt at that time and the wild parallels to us today around the Christmas story. And so the title of our message today is Wait For It. Some of you I know want to leave right now just because we're going to talk about waiting. I already got all kinds of flack from the dream team. Personal confession, I am terrible at waiting. Come on, just wave at me, honest people. If you hate the wait, look at this. Look at, I don't know, right now you should be scared because you're not getting out of this parking lot without some issues, <laughs> right? We hate the wait. For as long as I can remember, I hated waiting. I mean, I remember as like a tween, I was like, I don't have armpit hair yet. What's wrong with me? Like, I, I'm like every little thing, I just hated to wait. I knew that I wanted to marry my wife, Anna, at 18, and so we got married at 19. Come on, that was the best decision I ever made 20 years ago. But I wasn't about to wait. I hated the wait. And, and forget Christmas time. I mean, that's a whole nother level. Growing up in a family with six kids, I was the one that always found where the stash of gifts were. And man, I was like doing reconnaissance for all my siblings, right? I was finding out what we were getting and uh, may have opened a few gifts and tried to repackage them. It was bad. It was really bad. And not only have I struggled to, to learn how to wait in my life, but I think I have successfully passed down that generational curse to at least my youngest son, Jesse. <laughs> Poor kid. We were trying to order him some sneakers online, and they were coming from China. And then a week later, COVID hit. So you know, <laughs> I kid you not, we, we clicked on the tracking number, and it said it had left the warehouse. I'm sure it was like stuck on a boat in China somewhere. It showed up five months later. By the time the shoes came, his feet had grown. They were another size. I mean, it's just terrible. I have struggled waiting for a long time. And I, I am baffled by people who seem to have this uncanny ability to be patient. Like, Bel Air, you should just be really thrilled that your campus pastor is Pastor Joey, because I tell you what, he is one of the most godly people I know, not for all the reasons you might be thinking, but listen, he and Amy, they're expecting their third child to come in 2021 in April, and they're not finding out what they're having. Now, I can appreciate the excitement that there will be in the delivery room, but I could never do that. Like, I just could never not know. I want to know now. I have some friends that they weren't sure if they wanted to know or not, so they had the answer put in a little envelope, and they had it in their house. I'm like, who does that? I would rather experience medieval torture than have an envelope with the sex of our child. I mean, come on, somebody. This is really, I can't even have ice cream in my house without my self-control just, just being totally shot. I hate the weight. I think all of us do. I think all of us to some degree struggle with waiting. Some of you are waiting for your third quarantine to be over with so you can be around people. Some of us are waiting for virtual schooling to go away and never come back. Some of us, you know, you're, you're exercising, you're dieting, and you're waiting for the results and the progress to show. You're, you're in a relationship and you're waiting for him to put a ring on it. You're engaged and you can't wait to be married. You, Maybe you've married off your kids and now you're pestering them for grandbabies. Like, we just don't know how to wait. We're waiting for political tension to lift. We're waiting for medical results to come back. We're waiting for a loved one to get out of the hospital. We're waiting for signs that someone that we want to see come close to Jesus, that God is actually at work in their heart. We, we are waiting. Thankfully for us, the Bible is filled with helpful and, and hopeful things for people like us around the Christmas story because the Christmas story is a story of waiting. The Christmas story, it's filled with expectation and disappointment, with hope and doubt, with miracles and mistakes, with dreams and questions, with faith and fear, with drama and divine intervention, with saints and straight up crazy people. Like the Christmas story has all the feels. They were waiting for God to fulfill a promise and they were waiting for hundreds of years. Think about that. The last thing that the prophet Malachi in the Old Testament said, the last word of the Old Testament is the word curse. 
And for 400 years, that word would reverberate, echoing through silence. No prophetic words. No insight. It was, it was the spiritual dark ages. And to make things worse, the, the religious leaders were corrupt. They were greedy. Their faith had long expired. The people were waiting for a, a military ruler, for a Messiah to come to help deliver them under the thumb of Rome. But that was what they wanted. But what they needed was a Savior. Come on, to save the world, to save us from our sin. But as you know, so many things can happen on the inside when we are left waiting. And I want to talk about this because, you know, I know we're so familiar with the Christmas story. Some of us are over familiar with the Christmas story. Some of us were a part of the Christmas story. You had to act it out as a kid. Like how many of you went through that torturous experience in a pageant or some kind of Christmas play, whether it was school or church? You're like, I know the story. I had to act it out. I had to put a costume on and be in the story. But this morning, I want you to find yourself in the story again. We're going to look at the prequel to the Christmas story. We're going to look at the story found from the life of uh, Elizabeth and Zechariah, her husband. I want, the first thing I want you to see, the first thing that's so important that we understand is this, is that God is already at work in the people around you. Let me show you a verse that Pastor Wade preached in All the Fields Part 1. Luke chapter 1, we see the angel visiting Mary, and the angel says this. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One, Jesus, the Son of God, will be born, and he will be called the Son of God. Keep going. It says, even Elizabeth, your relative. Say, even your relative. Even your relative. Come on, look at somebody around you. Even your relative. Even your relative is going to have a child in her old age, and she who has said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Listen, one thing we have to understand as 2020 comes to a close and as we go into this Christmas season, God is doing something in the people around us. Listen, the story is, Mary, you're not the only one that has something supernatural going on inside of you. In fact, the angel says, the last person you would have thought, Mary, the person who you thought would never experience this, is actually having a work of God in the, on the inside of her. Come on, so some of us just need to know, I want to ask you this question. What name, what person pops into your mind right now when I say that, that God is at work and the people around you. What's, what's that person? Who's that relative? Even your relative, even your coworker, even the person you thought not in a million years is this going to happen. I just sense the spirit of God just saying, maybe you could join me in what I'm already doing because guess what? When you invite them for Christmas Eve, when you try to share your story with them, it's not a new work. I've already been at work for six months on the inside doing something you can't see. How about you join me? Come on, Freedom Church. We are people movers. We want to help people know God. God says, I've already been doing something that you can't even imagine. Just because it's unseen doesn't mean it's not happening. God says, I've already been there. I've been working for months. You just didn't know, and now I'm going to fill you in because I want you to know this Christmas that God is already at work in the people around us, the people who you think maybe are resistant to the Holy Spirit drawing them or the people you say that's the last person that would ever respond to an invitation to come to church. I'm telling you what. I've read statistic after statistic. It's like 80% of people, if they knew who they were going to sit with at church, would respond to your invitation. Now, I also heard a statistic that 70% of statistics are made up on the spot, but that one was not, okay? <laughs> so Freedom Church, come on, we're people movers. Whether you're part of our online campus and you want to share a link and invite someone, you've got to start reserving your seats because the gatherings are filling up. And we just want this place to be filled. Because why? Because we need to have a big church? No, because we want to partner with God with what he's already doing on the inside of people. That's what the Christmas story is all about. He's like, Mary, I'm going to blow your mind with what I'm about to do in you. But oh, by the way, even your relative is six months along in this miraculous process. God is doing something in the people around us. This, the next thing I want you to see is this, is that God's amazing plan is not hindered by our awful circumstances. Check out the scene that God is about to do some of his best work in. Luke 1, 5, it says this. When Herod was king of Judea, 
Now, let me give you like the non-children's uh, church version of Herod, okay? Hey, my man was crazy. I mean, crazy. The guy had nine wives, right? He executed one of his wives because she was getting on his nerves. Her name was Karen. And no, I'm just playing. Her name was something I can't even pronounce. But for real, he executed one of his wives, and he said it was his favorite wife out of nine. The guy was crazy. He executed three of his sons. Herod asked one of his wives as he was on his deathbed, catch this, this is the guy who, who ordered for all of the children two years old or younger to be killed. This is the insecure, neurotic, crazy leader that surrounds the Christmas story. On his deathbed, he said to one of his wives, he said, I know I don't have much time left to live. But he said, what I want you to do is I want you to fill the Colosseum with 2,000 people. And at the news of my death, I want them all to be killed. So that the whole nation mourns and people think that they're mourning over my death because I was such a great king. Can, can you just say crazy? <laughs> Herod was crazy. Even Caesar Augustus, Caesar was the one that gave Herod his power. And Caesar said, it's safer to be Herod's pig than to be his son. Because the guy was notorious for killing anybody that got close to him. He's, he was crazy. And listen, next week you're going to hear a message from Pastor Kelly. We're doing online only. No live gatherings on the 27th. You can watch church in your pajamas. But he's going to talk about the chaos factor that Herod brought. And how you don't have to let your life be ruined by the chaos factor that the enemy tries to bring in. I'm telling you, it's going to be so, so good. But here, here's the thing. They were in a spiritual dark age. They thought God didn't see what was going on. They thought God had forgotten what he had promised hundreds of years ago. I wonder if you've ever been there. When you feel like all hell is breaking loose and you're like, God, do you even see this? And then when you're pretty convinced that he sees it, you say, God, do you even care about this? Maybe you're in that season right now. Well, I came this morning to give you some good news because God was about to show up in that incredibly dark time. And he said, I'm about to turn the lights on. I'm about to show up in person and turn this. I'm about to answer the fulfilled prophecies in ways that would blow your mind. I'm about to intervene because I see and I care. And my plan is not going to be disrupted. No matter how terrible the circumstances are in your life, we've got to wait for it. Come on, we can't forget in the dark what God has spoken to us in the light. And they were in the spiritual dark ages. And this Christmas, I just wanted to remind us that God is already at work in the people around us and that God's amazing plan is not hindered by our awful circumstances. But I want to camp out here because this is where I think it's going to hit home. Watch this next point. Who we become, who we become while we're waiting is just as important as what we're waiting for. Maybe not a lot of amens, maybe an ouch. <laughs> but who I become while I'm waiting is just as important as what I'm waiting for. Let's go to verse 5. It says this. It said, was, when Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. Say Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife, Elizabeth, was also from the priestly line of Aaron. They were both incredibly righteous, both from ministry families, both from, both from priestly lines. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. They served in Freedom Kids. They took notes from Pastor Wade's sermons. They are going to the front of the line, people. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. Women were always blamed for infertility back in the day. Um, to not have a child was to not have a future. Not only would you not have someone to look after you in your older years, you had no status in society without children. Um, your dreams were wrapped up in your children. And they wanted to have another young little priest because they both came from a line of priests and there was an expectation to keep this lineage going. Talk about waiting for it. And there's almost this expectation because they loved God and they're in the will of God. They're serving him. They're righteous people. You think God, like... If you ever owed it to somebody, like, give them a kid, what's the big deal? But do you realize that if God had given them a child when they thought they wanted a child, their child that was coming, John the Baptist, would not have been paired up within six months of Jesus and would not have been able to fulfill his mission. 
Sometimes you just have to wait for it because when you try to help God anxiously, some of you, you know you're, you're like, Pastor Josh, my standards are really high. I'm waiting for a man. I'm waiting for a woman. I'm waiting for that right person, and I'm not going to lower or compromise my standards. Let me just tell you, wait for it. Do not try to help God. Do not try to mess with the process. I don't know how many trials we have created when we have violated God's timing. But who we become while we wait is just as important as the thing we're waiting for. And so God is having them wait in month after month, year after year, decade after de- I mean, can you imagine? They're, everybody around them is getting pregnant. They can't go to the temple without going to a child dedication. I mean, the dog is pregnant. The flocks and herds are multiplying. Like, everybody's womb is blessed except for Elizabeth's. Have you ever been there? You're like praying for something, and everyone around you is getting these breakthroughs and these answers and these miracles, and you're like, God, what is the deal? Who we become while we wait is just as important as the thing we're waiting for. I mean, Zechariah's name means Jehovah or God hears. God hears and has remembered. Elizabeth's name means God is my oath. In other words, God will be faithful to everything he said. It's not a cruel joke. God is just setting them up. He's setting them up for an incredible plot twist. But here's the question. What do you do when your name means God hears and remembers, but you don't feel heard? What do you do when your name literally means God will be faithful and you feel like he's forgotten about you? This is this couple. This is the, this is the prequel to the Christmas story. It's so easy to put God's character on trial when we're facing things like that. It's so easy to come to conclusions about ourselves and about God and about the world around us that can be so toxic and so dangerous if we let those things settle into our heart. Because we can just misjudge. We can, comparison can come in. God, why is this happening for them, but it hasn't happened for me? Entitlement can come in. God, I love you. I serve you. What is the, I deserve better than this. We might not say it, but it starts coming up in our hearts. Shame can settle in and we say, is it because of my past that this is not happening? Is it because of my sin? Blame can come in. We could say, it's your fault. It's their fault. It's somebody else's fault. But then doubt can creep in. And this is where Zechariah was. There was doubt and unbelief. God, are you even up there? I'm going to do the best I can to worship you while I'm waiting. But God, this is not right. You know, there's a, there's a gap between my timing and God's timing. <laughs> There's a gap between when I want it and when God will do it. We call that the meantime, right? We say in the meantime. Here's the problem. Some of us get mean in the meantime. <laughs> like we don't, we, we don't do it on purpose. And here's the scary truth. The people closest to us pay the highest price. We become irritable and impatient with our, our spouse, our kids, our coworkers, our friends. And it has nothing to do with them. Really, we're saying, God, why haven't you done what I've expected you to do? This is where they were. Now, I want to quickly give you something because uh, we do this at 252, one of our leadership development programs, and we talk about the laws of waiting. I just want to read this to you. Some psychologists were writing a blog on waiting, and because I stink at waiting so much, this like really spoke to me, so I hope it helps you. (laughs) Six laws of waiting. Number one, unoccupied time feels longer than occupied time. You could spend two and a half hours like that watching a movie, but if you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't sleep, two and a half hours feels like two weeks. Unoccupied time feels longer than occupied time. Number two, uncertain waits are longer than known waits. This is kind of like a little tricky. This is like when you go to the doctor's office and they take you into the quote-unquote waiting room to move you to another waiting room. And then you see someone come in, but it's not the doctor, it's a nurse, and they're tricking you. You're like, how long am I going to wait for this COVID test? Like, how, what's happening? Right? If you could just tell me how long. I have a, I have a friend who is a fitness trainer, and he would always laugh at me because he would, he would tell us what we were doing. Like, and all I would say is, is this every minute on the minute? Is this for, what, 30 seconds till burnout? And he would laugh. He was like, Josh, why does it matter? And I'm like, I need to know. I need to know these things. I need to mentally prepare myself. If it's an uncertain amount of time, it taxes you differently. Number three, unexplained waits are longer than explained waits. You're sitting in traffic with no explanation, and you pray that it's not a a traumatic car accident. 
but you really just want to know, why are we not moving? There's no explanation. It seems longer. An unfair wait feels longer than a fair wait. Unfair wait, you're at the MVA and you've got a number and somebody else tries to, you know, pretend like it's their turn or you're getting, you got your deli ticket. Why do you think they have the deli ticket system in the grocery store? I wonder how many fights went down when somebody was like, that's my boar's head sliced meat. It's my turn. Like I'm, or the system at Chick-fil-A where it's like every other car, you're like, they've got two lanes. I'm like, I'm about to eat some Christian chicken, but if you cut me in line, I don't care if it's the holidays. There's a system here, people. Thank God I don't have a fish or a Freedom Church bumper sticker on my car. There will be no unfair weights, right? Number five, solo weights feel longer than group weights. It's terrible to be trapped during the holidays in an airport, but it's even worse when you don't have a group of people to help kill the time with. A solo wait. Maybe, maybe you were married at one time and you had a great marriage and that spouse has passed away and now you're waiting for God's promise and because you feel like you're waiting alone, it seems so much longer. Number six, the greater the perceived value, the longer you're willing to wait. There was a man named Jacob who wanted to marry Rachel and the Bible says that it was a 14-year process, but because he loved her so much, it seemed like just a day. The longer you're willing to wait is the perceived value. Now, here's what I want to say. Sometimes God will slow things down around you because he's trying to do something deep within you. And we don't like it. We don't want to wait. But God's delay is not his denial. And, and who I become, who you become while you wait is just as important as what you're waiting for. And so Zachariah and Elizabeth, they're thinking this is not going to happen for us. But how many of you know God comes and brings a plot twist in your story at just the right time? Come on, verse 8, look at this. Look at this verse, it says one day. Come on, somebody say one day. All it takes is one day, one moment, and God can shift everything. One day, Zechariah was serving God in the temple, for his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priests, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and to burn incense. There was actually a 24 priest rotation where you'd be on certain weeks and not. This was the high day of atonement. This is a great time for him to be serving. But in the middle of his job, let me just say this. God knows where to find you. God knows you, your routine. Here's the thing I love about Zechariah. I know he was mad at God. I know unbelief crept into his heart because the angel shows us in a moment. I know that, but he still showed up and did what he was. He's, listen, how many of you know you can still worship while you're mad at God? You can still worship while you've got questions. You can still worship while you have doubts. Zacharias still showed up and God said, I know exactly where to find him. Just keep doing what you're supposed to be doing and God will find you. But the angel said, don't be afraid. Don't you love how every time an angel shows up, that's what they have to say? How terrifying. You're just doing your job and there's an angel there. Like, terrifying. Zechariah, why doesn't he have to be afraid? Because God has heard your prayer. Why should I not fear? Because God has heard your prayer. Listen, don't be afraid when your situation looks like it still remains unchanged. Don't be afraid when people have given up hope. Don't be afraid when you have given up hope. Why? Because God has heard your prayer. Come on, God has heard your prayers about your kid's future, about your financial needs, about the big dream you have in your heart that you're embarrassed to talk about, about the addiction or the struggle or the lie that you're hiding because of shame or the hurting people that you love to see come to Jesus. Why do I not? have to fear because God has heard your prayers. Come on, somebody. God has heard your prayers. The angel says, Zechariah, do not fear. Listen, when we know that our prayers have been delivered, it's powerful in delivering us from our fears. Even when the situation remains unchanged, as long as I know the big man upstairs has heard me, as long as I know it's on his desk, it's on his radar, and the Bible says that he hears you. For those of you who have yet to even step into a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Bible says that God hears your prayer. I mean, if a, a prophet in rebellion in the belly of a whale, God says, while seaweed was wrapped around his head, read the book of Jonah, God says, I heard your prayer, Jonah. Verse 13, the angel says, listen, your wife Elizabeth will give you a son and you are to name him John. I'm so fascinated that heaven already knew his name. 
You have a destiny. God knew you before he even sent you here. You will have a great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. Isn't that the only eyes that really matter? Your son is going to be great. He must never touch wine or any other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He's not just going to be great. He's going to be godly. He is going to live a life of godliness. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. Parents, let me just pause for a second. If you've read any of the story of Elijah, my man had some intensity about him. <laughs> I wonder how many times John the Baptist had to be disciplined as a kid. I'm thinking this kid probably was one ornery little kid. Like stubborn, always thought he was right, correct. You don't become John the Baptist, the prophet, the messenger paving the way for the Messiah, not having a little edge to you. How many times, like the parent-teacher conference, it was awkward because you're like, they're like, your son, I, he always thinks he's right. I don't even know what to do. He is so stubborn, <laughs> right? <laughs> Parents, I just want, I want to encourage you, listen, don't forget in the dark what God spoke to you in the light. He's saying to him, listen, you're going to have to raise Elijah. Not an easy thing. But he said he's going to be great in the eyes of the Lord. And he's going to be incredibly godly. And he is going to go before Jesus and he's going to pave the way for the Son of God. He's going to turn the hearts of the Father to their children. And he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. My friend, you have to have a backbone to do that. John the Baptist was not the easiest child to raise. Isn't it funny? The very thing you pray for, the very thing you're waiting for, once God gives it to you, then it, all the stress in your life revolves around that thing. You're like, okay, God, maybe I'm too old for this. In fact, he sa this, is, this is what he says, to the, he says to the angel in verse 18. He says, how can I be sure this is going to happen? I'm an old man. And watch what he says. And my wife, she's well along in years too. Like, so polite. They've been married a long time. My man, he's like, my old lady, she old. <laughs> like, she, God, I don't know how this thing is going to work. And it's funny because Mary asked the same angel the same question. When Gabriel, the angel, came to Mary and she said, how is this going to happen? He gave her an answer and it was all good. But when Zechariah asked, how is this going to happen? Now, all of a sudden, he's going to be mute for nine months, and God says, you're going to lose your voice, and I'm not going to have that unbelief coming out of your heart around the womb of John the Baptist. Why is that? I think because there was something different going on in Mary's heart than in Zechariah's heart. Because who I become while I wait is just as important as the thing I'm waiting for. And God graciously gave Zechariah the answer to his prayer, but he also said, listen, you asked the same question as Mary to the same angel, but you're going to get a different response. You're going to lose your voice for a little bit. Because I need, to, I need to work on some things in your heart with you, Zachariah, as you wait for this answer. How can this be? And I love this. And i got to tell you, I can't, I can't imagine how hard it was for them to wait. But can I be honest with you? The only thing harder than waiting on God, the only thing harder than waiting on God is wishing that you had. When we reach in and try to help God, when we try to do things in the arm of the flesh, when we try to make it happen before God's timing, what does the Bible say? It says he blesses and adds no sorrow to it, which means if I try to bless myself, I heap all kinds of sorrow and all kinds of weight that he never intended for me to carry. Who we become while we're waiting is just as important as what we're waiting for. But I love this because Zechariah, he's anxious, he's uncertain. In verse 20, the angel's like, listen, for my words will certainly be fulfilled, say it with me, at the proper time. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. What is he saying? He's saying, listen, God is not playing with your emotions. God is not trying to just say your name means Jehovah remembers. Your name means God is your faithful oath. He's not playing with your emotions. He says, at the proper time. I have some good news for you. God is good at answering our tired prayers. Maybe this January, January 3rd, we're kicking off 21 days of prayer. Maybe it's the perfect time to jumpstart your prayer life in the new year after the year that we've had in 2020. I'm telling you what, time has a, has a 
does a, does a number on our soul when you're waiting for a promise from God. When you stop believing for it. Maybe you've asked yourself the question, God, you're run, it seems like you're running out of time. And, and the question I want to ask is, is God running out of time or am I running out of patience? Tell your neighbor, wait for it. Wait, listen, I've got some good news for you. Too late is not in God's vocabulary. Come on, your calendar does not intimidate your creator. I've got news for somebody. You should never let age become your gauge on the dream of God because the God you serve can turn the story around in a moment at the proper time. He says, I see you. I hear you. I feel what you're going through at the proper time. God says, I will do it at the proper time time at the proper time my word will certainly be fulfilled come on Romans 8 28 says and God is able to make all things work together for the what for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose I've got to tell you Freedom Church if it's not good then it's not done if it's not God come on Freedom Church if it's not good then God is not done tell somebody wait for it wait for it God is already at work in the people around us this Christmas season. He's able to do something amazing even in the awful circumstances we find ourselves in. And who we become while we're waiting is just as important as the thing we're waiting for. And the last thing I want to give you as we close is that God is not only committed to meeting your needs, but he wants to reveal his nature. I love this. This is my favorite verse in this story. It says, when Zechariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterwards, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion for five months. Then she says this, how kind the Lord is. Her frustrated how long had turned into a grateful how kind. What if the kindness of God came to you this Christmas? What would that look like for you? What would that look for? I, there are so many of us that are saying, how long, oh Lord? How long, God? How long? But what if that how long could be transformed into a how kind? How kind? God is, Scripture says that love is patient and love is kind. What if the patience, what if love's patience could introduce you to God's kindness? Love is patient and love is kind. Elizabeth said at the end of it all, how kind you are. 2020 has been so crazy hard in, in unthinkable ways. And we've felt, faced pressure that I don't know when we'll lift. I don't know how long you're going to have to wait for it. We go through hard things. We go through things that we wish God could shield us from. We go through things that we feel like we don't earn or deserve or merit. People we love go through hard things. We go through things and we don't get all the answers that we want. But when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to understanding God, when it comes to understanding the Christmas story, you don't have to look for some mystery. The, the main thing is the plain thing. <laughs> like the main thing is the thing that just stands outright and it just says, even in the midst of all the feels and all the pressure, and as Pastor Wade said last week, and all these things, come on, God is still good. He is still powerful. He is still for you. He is still with you. Even when we doubt him, even when we drift from him, he is still so, so unbelievably kind. Elizabeth says, how kind. Of all the words she could have used, he's so powerful. He's so, he's so kind. And I love this quote as we close from C.S. Lewis, the band can come. C.S. Lewis said this. I read this off of a uh, laptop sticker from one of our Freedom School of Ministry students. It just wrecked me. C.S. Lewis, I know, Lord, why you utter no answer. Some of you might feel like you're in a spiritual dark age. He says, I know now, Lord, why you utter no answer. You are yourself the answer. Before your face, questions die away. He says, when I stand in your presence, God, how can I even have these questions for you? What other answer would suffice? What is C.S. Lewis saying? He's saying, 
at the end of the day, it's not even the answer that you're after. You're after God. You're after the person behind the breakthrough. You're really in your soul, really in your heart. You're not looking just for your life to kind of be put together and have no stress. Really what you're craving is, is God, I need you. I need to see you. I need to know you. I, I just need to know you're in this with me. That's the whole Christmas story. God, it's pretty dark right now. I got crazy leaders running around and Herod's trying to kill people. And, but God, you're with me. Deep down inside, we know it's not just answers that we want. It's God himself. And the changing of the clock and the turning over of the calendar and the, the rolling into a new year honestly changes nothing unless we change. And unless we open our hearts and allow the grace of God to come in and to do his work, his unseen supernatural work, and I just want to say, as we close today, I've been saying, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. But listen, the most important thing in Scripture, when it comes to salvation and having a relationship with God, God would say to you, don't wait for it. It's the one thing in Scripture that you don't have to say, oh, I don't know, maybe I have to get myself right, maybe I have to get my life cleaned up, maybe I have to present, but I don't know, maybe I have to come for like six months or a year or like three years before I can be like really in. No, no, no. When it comes to salvation, when it comes to experience the forgiveness of God, he says, don't wait. In fact, he says, today, right now, those that are watching live, those that will watch us as a future broadcast, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to know that God is in your life, to know that you can experience the forgiveness of God. So I just want you to bow your heads all across this room. Nairobi campus, online campus, let's just bow our heads and bow our hearts before God. The Christmas story is that though there are things you have to wait for in this life for God to fulfill his promise, you never have to wait knowing, am I forgiven? Where do I stand with God? And so today, some of you may have come in with questions. You may say, Pastor Josh, if you do my story... If you knew the failed marriages, the failed businesses, the terrible choices that I've made, if, if, you, if Jesus knew the questions and doubts and hurts that I'd be bringing into this relationship, friend, I just want to say to you, Jesus would say, come, don't wait. Receive my forgiveness. Receive my life. Let me do a work inside of you that you could never do for yourself. So with every head bowed, I just want to ask you this question. In a second, we're just going to pray this prayer together out loud. But for some of you, you may be praying this for the first time, or maybe this is a, a homecoming for you. But you'd say, Josh, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And I believe that I need His forgiveness and I need His grace. If that's you, don't wait. Come on, Bel Air Campus online, wherever you are, let's, let's say this prayer out loud together. Just say, Jesus... I believe, I believe that you're the son of God. I believe that I need you in my life. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your grace to live a life that would be impossible without you. I invite you into my story. Would you take over as author? In Jesus' name. Come on, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to ask, if you prayed that prayer with me for the first time, just, just raise your hand. Just wave at me. Just say, Josh, I prayed that prayer. I'm not ashamed. Listen, th God bless you for your courage. God bless you, ma'am. Just raise your hand to say, you know, I prayed that prayer. The Bible says, do not be ashamed of praying that prayer before men, and I will never, ever be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. Come on, Bel Air campus. Come on, can we just stand to our feet? Can we give a hand for those that prayed that prayer? Come on, God says, I am with you. I am working on your behalf. I'm gonna do something inside of you. Come on, that's the Christmas story. That's what we celebrate.